Welcome back to Sunny School, guys. I hope that you're having a wonderful week or have had a wonderful week. Um, I don't know if y'all can tell, but I got a haircut. Get just a little smidge normal back in my life. I had a uh, crazy long hair. I don't know if you could tell uh, in the videos, but my hair was down to where I could, I could chew on my own hair. That's how long it was in the front. Uh, it was also long in the back. But uh, it feels so nice to have one, just a simple little thing like a haircut um, that you haven't had in a long time. So I hope you've had a little bit of uh, normal start to come back a little bit in your life. I know they opened the beaches. Hopefully you've been able to get some sun, a little bit of sand and water in your life. Uh, if not, hopefully you can do that soon. But I'm excited to see uh, us having a little bit of things reopen, sit down at a restaurant, uh, have a little bit of nice food, things like that. I hope y'all are, are gonna be able to experience some of those things. Uh, reminder, last week we had Zoom at one o'clock and we talked on that Zoom and decided that one o'clock was too close to lunch and y'all wanted to do it a little bit later in the afternoon. So we are doing it at 2.30. You should have already gotten a text from me about this. So you should already know that, but in case you forgot, it's at 2.30 today. So I hope you'll join us. We're gonna have uh, some fun activities. Uh, we're going to have a, a little video in this um, uh, Sunday School lesson. We're going to have a couple more of those types of videos. So if you like the video that's in this one, we're going to do some of those on the Zoom call live together uh, and kind of have some fun with that. So hopefully you like the, uh, the video and you'll want to do some more of it because we're going to do that uh, on the Zoom call. So we've talked some, uh, gosh, maybe a month ago about what makes something believable how do you decipher what truth is amongst all of the um, different people and different things that are claiming to be true or claiming to get your attention? Um, we talked about the chocolate theme park. I don't know if you remember that. We had a bunch of true-false questions uh, about the color of the house of the Australian government, things like that. Um, but we're going to dive into that again today, but we're going to take a slightly different approach. So. Today we're going to talk about the idea of idols and false teachings and um, like a, a, a false god. And uh, we're going to see that on Paul's missionary journey. So if you remember where we left off, um, two weeks ago we studied uh, Paul's first missionary journey, which is this black um, kind of loop here on the chart. And then... Last week, we studied the second missionary journey, which is this huge red one all the way around here and then back, right? So we left off uh, last week, and they were coming into Macedonia, which is this big orange section here, and um, they're now moving down into Athens. So we're going to pick up the story in Acts uh, when they're in Athens. But first, uh, I want to just think about, have you ever... And I know you have. So think of the time when you have um, been just fighting with a sibling or with a friend or maybe your parents about something that you just knew you were right. You were, without a doubt, 100 percent confident that you were right and you were arguing it to the ground only to as the conversation goes on, you become less and less confident that you're actually right. Uh, I was, when I was preparing this lesson, I was talking um, to Miss Kristen about it, and I showed her the example that I'm about to, to explain to you, and she was frustrated because the example that I'm giving is the time that she was wrong, when in actuality, I'm wrong way more often uh, of the time. This type of thing happens to me pretty much constantly, where I think I'm right, and Miss Kristen is actually right. And I argue with her, and I just decide, no, I'm right. And then by the time we finish the conversation, I realize, maybe in the back of my head, that, ooh, she might be right about that. But of course, I don't want to admit that, because uh, I'm prideful. And so I just, like, stop arguing and move on, because I don't want to talk about it anymore, because I've now realized that she's right. Um, but it, it happened just, like, two days ago. And so I decided to use the most recent example, which was we're sitting on the couch, and uh, she is, or I'm sitting on the couch, she's getting uh, all the food ready for dinner, and she asked me to put something on the TV, so I grabbed the remote, turn it on to some TV show that we wanted to watch, and I set the remote down, kind of off a uh, cushion or so away from me on the couch, and I'm, you know, sitting down to enjoy the TV. 
And then she comes in, brings the food. We tend to eat on the couch sometimes these days. And so she brings in the food and she sits down, lo and behold, next to me on the couch. We eat dinner, we watch the TV, and then when it's time for me to get up and I gotta go uh, take care of something, I'm like, all right, I'm done. I'm gonna go ahead into the other room. She's like, hey, can you turn off the TV? And I'm like, no problem. And then I look around and I can't find the remote, right? Also, if you know me very well, you know I have a terrible memory, and so I have a hard time remembering what I did. So I, I, I'm like, oh, I stuck it over there, right? So I'm like, hey, babe, you got the remote. And she goes, no, I don't. I don't have the remote. You had the remote. You turned the TV on. I don't have the remote over here. And I'm like, babe, it's on the other side of the cushion. You have the remote. And she was like, no, it's not around me. I don't have the remote. And she like, starts to look around like to prove to me, see, see, I don't have the remote. And then she turns, and there's the remote. And then she turns back with this gigantic grin on her face. She was like, that was not me. Like, it's now, you know, my fault that she has the remote, right? And so it's just an example where she was confident that she knew that she didn't have the remote. Now, granted, she didn't put the remote there, but the remote was with her, right? And so I knew that she had it. Well, today we're going to study a story um, about when Paul goes into Athens and he uh, is communicating with the people there and sees that they're studying and, and or worshiping false gods. They're studying or they're worshiping. I don't know why I keep saying that. Um, idols and things like that. And so he decides that he's going to explain to them why they should not worship those and worship God instead. Um, but it can be difficult. It can be really difficult to determine um, what is false and what is true. We, we, like I said, we studied that a couple weeks ago. So we're going to do a quick little exercise before we dive into the scripture um, to see if you can spot the fake and spot the real. So I'm going to play a video. It's going to have a series of different uh, op options where it's going to give you two things or maybe a bunch of things, and you have to decide which one's real and which one's fake. So I want you to... Um, Every time a new one comes up, pause it, look at it, try to do your best to determine which one's real, which one's fake, make your selection, and then play the video and see what, uh, if you're right. And I want to, we'll talk on the Zoom call maybe, see who got the most right, and we'll see how y'all do. But we're going to uh, cut to that video.
OK, so as you can tell, sometimes it can be really difficult to determine which one's real and which one's fake. As you went along in the video, did you find it a little bit easier to try to find the little, little details that might tip you off as to which one was real or which one was fake? I know when I watched it at the very beginning, man, I was 50-50. I was just kind of guessing. I don't know. Maybe that one. Maybe that one. But as the video went on, I realized I could, I could, I could tell just little, little things that helped tip me off. And I started to get better and better and better because I was studying what real looked like versus what was not real. So let's dive in to Acts and let's see how that kind of plays out in the passage today. So we're going to be Acts chapter 17. I'm going to start in verse 16. Words will be on the screen. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was deeply distressed when he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with those who worshiped God, as well as in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also debated with him. Some said, what is this ignorant show off trying to say? Others replied, he seems to be a preacher of foreign deities or gods because he was telling the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. They took him and brought him to Areopagus and said, may we learn about these new teachings you are presenting because what you say sounds strange to us and we want to know what these things mean. Now all of the Athenians and the foreigners residing there spent their time on nothing else but telling or hearing something new. So we're going to stop there for a minute. And let's think for a second about what is an idol. So Paul comes into Athens here, and he sees that they're worshiping all kinds of idols. What is an idol? Well, an idol really is just something that we worship. In this particular case, it was statues, it was objects, it was uh, maybe an altar to a particular god. Um, they were setting up various altars and various um, uh, idols in a place so that they could come in and worship those things. But that doesn't necessarily mean that idols are al always a, uh, a statue or a physical thing. Sometimes in your life, you may find that you idolize a person. You may idolize an a, a athlete or a, a singer or a uh, actor you may idolize a teacher, a coach, or your uh, father, mother, or, or even maybe your pastor. There's a lot of different people that you could idolize. You could idolize your phone. You could idolize information. You just are so obsessed with gaining more and more information that it becomes an idol, something that you worship in your life, something that's more important than everything else. But let's not get too down that rabbit hole. Let's um, focus here on th the Athenians and their idols were these actual physical things, they, these actual things in front of them. Um, so they believed that these objects could represent or even be a god. Um, they believed that if they set up this altar, they set up the statue, that that god would look down upon that and that they could kind of have a, a channel or a way to communicate with that god. Um, we're going to find out a little later that they uh, were even kind of worried about that because they set up God, uh, altars to gods they didn't even know about. We'll, we'll get into that. Um, so what does Paul do? He's like, these guys are worshiping the wrong thing. They got the wrong idea. They do not know the truth. And so Paul says, I got to do something about this. I'm not just going to sit around and watch them worship uh, another god or a false god or an idol. I'm going to tell them about the one true god, the person who is actually worthy of their worship. Um, so that's what he does. So he goes around, tells basically anyone. He says for days, he just anyone who would talk to him, he's telling them about the gospel of Jesus. And then it says that some philosophers... Uh, wanted to engage him in this, and so they brought him to Areopagus. We're not going to go into Areopagus too much, but basically it was a place where all the, small, all the smart people were. Okay, It was your philosophers, your teachers, your 
historians, uh, just everyone who's who just interested in knowledge, interested in learning, interested in uh, understanding the world around them, and various uh, astrologers maybe, studying the stars. Those are all the types of different people that you might have at uh, Arapagus. So they're like, all right, you seem to have some information. We want to talk to you about it. Let's bring you into this group of people who um, want to know about more information, right? So it says, that, that last verse said, uh, Now all the Athenians and foreigners residing there spent their time on nothing else but telling and hearing about something new. That's what these people were interested in, knowledge. So we're going to pick up uh, verse 22. Paul stood in the middle of Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that you are extremely, extremely religious in every respect. For as I was passing through and observing the objects of your worship, I even found an altar on which was inscribed to an unknown God. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, he is Lord of heavens and earth, does not live in shrines made by hands, like the idols that are around. Neither is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything, since he himself gives everything, uh, everyone life and breath and all things. From one man, he has made every nationality to live over the whole earth and has determined their appropriate times and the boundaries of where they live. He did this so that they might seek God and perhaps they might reach out and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him, we live and move and have our being. And even some of you, your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Since we are God's offspring, then, we shouldn't think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image fashioned by human art and imagination. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God now commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has set a day when he is going to judge the world in righteousness by the man he has appointed. He has provided proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some began to ridicule him, but others said, we'd like to hear from you again about this. So Paul gets an opportunity, a unique audience, to speak to all of these people who are seeking knowledge, seeking information, and he engages them on an intellectual level. He engages them in a way where he's saying, Look around you, look at the world and understand who God is. And he targets specifically, he's like, God is not manifested in these idols, in these things that are fashioned by humans. It's not in gold or silver or stone. And he's, I'm sure, directly talking about the idols that he's seen. And in fact, he points one out specifically and says, you even have an idol to someone you don't even know exists. You say to an unknown God, right? You're so worried about making sure that you're worshiping all the potential options. You don't even know. And so you just set up one and be like, well, there's maybe someone we missed. So we'll set up one to that guy. I don't know his name, so we'll call him unknown, right? And so Paul's like, guys, I have the truth. I have the one true God. None of the rest of this matters. So Paul tries to bring them in and says, it's a, you know, I, I recognize that you're religious, that you are seeking a God, right? Because that's why you have all of these idols. There's plenty of people who don't even believe that God exists, right? But he's like, no, you obviously are seeking a higher power, some sort of a God, and I've got it. So he talks to them and explains to them. Now, we've talked about the idea of... Um, knowing what is true and what is not, right? Because these guys, like Kristen with the remote, I'm sure thought that they knew what was going on. They're like, we've done this. We've got these set up because we think that this is the truth. And obviously some people here says they, it says they ridiculed them. I'm sure they were like, you don't know what you're talking about. What are you even saying, right? And they put him down or made fun of him and probably maybe even called him an idiot. Right? Because they're like, this guy is a lunatic. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Now, some listened. How do you determine what is true and what is not? Right? Um, 
And how do you engage with people who have differing opinions from you? So that's what we're going to talk about just, just for a second here. How do you know what to believe? Now, I could do a whole lesson, and maybe I will one day, um, on why you should believe the Bible. I'm going to lightning quick go through why I believe in the Bible and why I think you should. And each one of these things that I'm going to say, we could dive in for a long time. But the Bible is a historical book written by eyewitnesses in the time of other eyewitnesses. It has been preserved by rigorous processes to ensure its accuracy. The prophecies that are in the Bible were written well before the events that take place in the Bible, and all of the prophecies are 100% correct. Not a single prophecy has been proven to be in error. Now, there are some prophecies that haven't happened yet, talking about the coming of Jesus, Revelation, all this kind of stuff, but every prophecy that has happened has happened exactly as the prophets suggested right so then you have the historical and geographic accuracy so it's a history book and it talks about events in history and we have other history books and other events that say the same thing they agree on certain aspects of what the bible says on what happened and in no way does the events that happened in the bible disagree with the things that we see and we even have evidence of historical and uh, archaeological and scientific things that point to the Bible being true and uh, correct. And so all of those things, and like I said, there's a ton of evidence that we could dive into each one of those different areas and discuss it. But those are all the reasons why I believe that the Bible is a source of truth. And I hope that you won't take just my word on it. I hope that as you go into middle school and in high school, you'll continue to study God's word. You'll dive into the, uh, the science and all the different things that are out there. And because I am confident that if you study about God's word and in God's word, you will walk away believing that God's word is true and that we should believe every word. So I encourage you to do that. Um, and once we have that as our basis, so once we get to the point where we say, this is truth. We now have a basis to evaluate everything else, right? We have a, a basis for saying what else is true. So um, we should be seekers of truth. That's an important thing that we should do moving forward is we should always take in people's opinions, people's inputs, and we should evaluate them against what we know to be true, the Bible, right? So if someone has an opinion, Listen to them. See what they have to say. They might actually help you to gain knowledge in um, what the Bible says, what it means. Right? The pastor's constantly studying God's word, and he's going to deliver his um, message. You listen to that. You, you dive into God's word, and you allow that to adjust the way that you, what you believe and how that impacts how you live. Um, don't ever think that you know everything. Don't ever think that you are 100% true about every single thing, except for maybe that the Bible is what you need to believe in. That, I think, that you can be 100% sure of. But with everything else, be confident in what you believe, but be open to listen. Be open to the idea that you may not be 100% right, and that someone else may have a nugget of information that may improve your understanding of a situation. So the people in this were seekers of truth. We should not turn ourselves off to, to, to truth. We should seek it, and we should try to understand it. And that's an important thing in our life. A lot of uh, people get very um, kind of closed-minded. They think that they know what they want, and they don't want to hear anything else. And that's just not what God's Word teaches, and it's not um, what's healthy in our life. God wants us to be learners. He wants us to understand what's around us, and He wants us to, uh, to dive in and understand the truth of things. So I, I encourage you to continue to do that. Um, and it continues with the Bible, right? You can learn more and more and more. I have read the same passage five times, and on the fifth time I learned something new, right? The Bible just continues. As you learn more about the Old Testament, the New Testament makes more sense. And as you learn about the New Testament, the Old Testament makes more sense. And just your understanding grows and grows and grows. And then every time you revisit something, every time I prepare a lesson to teach our class, there's a little nugget that I'm like, oh man, I hadn't thought of that. I hadn't realized how this 
works with that. And it's just, it's so exciting to, to kind of see all of those things come together. So even in your study of God's word, continue to have an open mind and learn about all of those things because you'll continue to learn more and more and more. Um, oh, and I even forgot one of the reasons why I study the Bible, and it's the ultimate power that the Bible has to change lives. So if you look at what the Bible does to people who study it, that in and of itself is a evidence and a proof of the power of God's word to come in and, and just completely and radically change someone's life who's willing to study and learn about God's will for their life. And that to me has, it has a supernatural ability to do that. Um, and it's one of the reasons why I think the Bible is uh, true. So, um, so, let's, so what, what's the last thing we need to do? So we need to be careful. We need to be careful who we trust and who we listen to and ultimately take all of those things back to the truth of God's word. So be careful who you allow to be your spiritual teacher and who you listen to and make sure that what they're saying makes sense with what God's word says. Be careful um, of, that anyone tells you something is true when it doesn't make sense with God's word. If we agree that God's word is the truth, then if someone says something that disagrees, I'm going to question whether what they're saying is true. Um, don't allow items, your phone, your uh, celebrities, people, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, uh, to be an idol in your life. Don't make the same mistake that the Athenians did and uh, allow other things, other objects of worship to enter your life. Worship Christ and Christ alone. Um, he's the only thing that is worthy of your worship. So if you find yourself maybe idolizing something a little too much, uh, it's time to reevaluate your priorities in life and maybe dial that back to a healthy level of maybe respect um, for someone but, or for something, but not make it an idol, something that you worship in your life. Um, we're gonna close out today with um, kind of a visual picture about truth and uh, what is real and what is fake or what is uh, not a very good approximation of the thing that's real. And we're going to do that with Coca-Cola. So um, we're going to close out on that and uh, we're going to do that right now. All right, guys. So what we have today is a bunch of different types of Coke. Uh, I'm going to call it that because Coke's my favorite. Um, you might call it soda. You might call it pop might call it soda pop, you might just call it Coke like me, I don't know. Um, but we have various forms of Coke. And you have uh, Coke, you have Diet Coke, you have, I guess the newest uh, on the block is the Coke Zero. You have uh, Pepsi, which you're probably familiar with as well. Some of you may or may not know RC Cola. Um, this is more your, like on the cheaper side, but it's still trying to give you that same kind of uh, similar taste, similar uh, carbonation, similar bite that you get from Coke. Um, these two are trying to do that as best as they can, but not have sugar. They're trying to have, uh, you know, some other uh, thing used in it, but still they want to give that same, like, taste, that same kind of experience that you get with Coke, but they're trying to do it a little bit different. Same thing with these others, right? So, Today, we're gonna like think about and talk about the idea of what is true and what is uh, not true or fake or uh, not quite the same, right? So in this case, the manufacturers of Coca-Cola have a particular recipe. They have a particular, um, you know, they invented the taste and the, you know, the what goes into Coke. I don't know what all it is. There's all kinds of ingredients on the back here that uh, don't make uh, a lot of sense to me, but the end product is a beverage that is one of my favorites. We talked about milk last week. That's probably my favorite drink, uh, followed closely behind by Coca-Cola. And I don't drink a whole lot else. I drink like milk, Coke, Powerade, water. That might be it. I am sure there's a couple of other little, maybe orange juice occasionally, but like I'm a pretty simple man when it comes to drinks. Coca-Cola is one of those. Um, and it's very different, each one of these. Now, if I were to ask you, close your eyes, and I were to pour a glass of each one of these drinks, and I were to blindfold you, and I were to say, 
which one is the real Coke? Would you be able to tell? Furthermore, would you be able to tell me which was which? Would you be able to tell me which one's Pepsi, which one's Coke, which one's Diet Coke? Now, I would probably very, very easily and quickly be able to tell you which one is Coke. I've drank a ridiculous amount of Coke. So I know what Coke tastes like. And in fact, I'm kind of a little bit of a snob in it in that I like glass bottled Cokes because they use cane sugar instead of whatever high fructose corn syrup is. They taste better to me. I like that one. It, it, it's subtle. The difference between this Coke and a Coke with cane sugar is subtle, but it's noticeable to me because I've had so much of it that I can tell those little nuances. Miss Kristen tends to drink diet drinks more often, so she probably could tell you the difference between Diet Coke and uh, Coke Zero. I'm not sure that I could, honestly. I don't really drink a lot of them. I don't really know the nuances and the differences between the two. I know they're both trying to be a low uh, sugar version of Coke, but I'm not, um, I don't really particularly prefer either one of them, and so I don't really drink a lot of them. Um, but she probably could be like, oh yeah, this is definitely Diet Coke, and this is definitely Coke. And she knows what is Coke and what is, what is supposed to be hers. Because when we go to Chick-fil-A or we go to a restaurant and they give us two cups and she takes them home and they didn't mark it, you know, you, you get home and they didn't punch the little things on top. You're like, ah, oh, come on, which one's which? If I put in a straw or she puts in a straw and either one of us takes a sip, we're both like, nope, nope, this is yours, right? Because we both immediately, immediately know which one. Now, again, I, I couldn't tell you if it's diet or if it's Coke Zero, but I know it's not mine. It's not, it's not Coke, right? Uh, and same thing happens when I go to a restaurant. They say, you know, I say I want Coke. They say, is Pepsi okay, right? And sometimes I say no, because I don't actually prefer Pepsi all that much, but um, sometimes I will. Sometimes I'll drink Pepsi. Sometimes I just want that like Coke type flavor and they don't have Coke, so I can't get what I really prefer. So I just say, all right, well, maybe I'll, I'll do with Pepsi, right? Um, but I know it's not Coke. Like I can tell it's not the same. Um, so could you do that? How well do you think you would do? Now, I don't know how many RC Cola drinkers we have out there. Uh, I haven't drinking a ton of it, but when I was younger, probably your age at, you know, you go to Walmart and they have the drink machines and one, they'd have a drink machine with Coke in it. It's probably like 50 cents. Uh, and then you have a drink machine and RC Cola was like a quarter. It was like 25 cents. And so, you know, I'd be like, mom, 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 I want a drink. I want a drink. I'm thirsty. I'm hot. Uh, you know, and I'm like bugging her because I want a drink and I want Coke. And she's like, ah, here's a quarter. You can get RC Cola. Right. I'm like, ah, OK. Well, it's still, again, kind of like Coke, still has a kind of similar flavor, but it's just not quite the same. And guys, that's like uh, our, our life and, and, and scripture and understanding what is true and what is fake. If you drink a lot of Coke or Pepsi or Diet Coke, whatever your beverage of choice is, you know what that tastes like. You know the little nuances of that beverage because you've had it so much and you can tell when some other beverage is in your cup. And it's the same with God's word. It's the same with truth. We should study, consume, God's word so much that we know backwards, forwards, up and down, beyond a shadow of a doubt, what the truth is. So that when something else comes up, someone else has a, an opinion or a statement or they believe something, they are worshiping something else, whatever, that we know, no, 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 that is not what God's word says. Because I know God's word. How many of you, and I bet you probably none of you, know God's word so well that if someone came up and said, oh, this is in the Bible, that you could be like, no, it isn't. I bet you you wouldn't because at sixth grader, you probably have not studied God's word so much that you know what is and what isn't in it. Now, you might can say some things that are in it because you've studied. We've, we've done a bunch of stories. You know Paul went on a couple missionary journeys. You could say, yeah, that's in the Bible. You can say, Jesus died on the cross. Yeah, I know that's in the Bible. But if someone came up and said, oh yeah, this is in the Bible, this is truth, and you hadn't heard it before, probably the best you could do is like, I haven't heard that. I haven't read that. I haven't seen that. 
And maybe you would need to go and look and see, is that actually in the Bible? Is that something that is true? Again, we talked about why I believe the Bible, right? We talked about why I think you should believe the Bible, and I encourage you to study those things so that we can come to a common understanding of what is true. And once you're there, then you say, okay, I'm going to take everything else that comes in, and I'm going to go against what I know to be true. And I'm going to say, someone says this is true. Someone says this is what Jesus said. Someone says that this, and I don't know that. I don't know that that's truth. Then guess what, guys? Before I just accept that, I need to go dive into God's word. I need to be like, does it really say that? Is that really what's going on here? And then that's going to help me learn more and more and more about what truth is. And hopefully, when you get to a point where you've just studied the Bible in and out, and someone says, this is in the Bible, you're going to be like, no, 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 it's not. Not only is it not in the Bible, but I can point to you multiple places in the Bible that says that that is not true. It's the opposite of what you're saying, or it's completely different than what you're saying, and I can show you where it is. You can be like, no, no, that's in Mark. Mark says that this is this way, not what you're saying, right? That's how much you want to know. You want to be able to when the truth gets poured in the glass and you drink it, you know it. Yep, this is it. This is Coke, right? This is the right stuff. And then when someone else pours something else in a glass and you drink a little bit of that, you might even get a little weird look on your face like, uh, 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 this is not what I had in mind. I've had times like that where I'll go to a place and I'll order Coke. And I, I had a, well, one time in particular, someone brought me a, the wrong beverage. They brought the person next to me's beverage but they had Coke with something else in it that mixed with it. And I took one sip and Kristen makes fun of me because my whole face changed. I was like, you know, took one sip out. I was like, oh, uh, uh. That, that is not right. That is not right. That is not Coke. That is nowhere close to Coke, even though it looked like Coke, right? I, I looked at the glass. I was like, oh yeah, same color, same thing. Oh yeah, that's Coke. Took one sip, not Coke, right? And I, and I was like visibly upset. Uh, right? And it was because someone else had taken in something and mixed the truth. And sometimes, guys, that happens. Sometimes they take a little bit of truth, and they take a little bit of not truth, and they put them together so that they look like the truth. Maybe it acts like the truth in some cases, but they've got a little bit of extra in there that's not truth, and it makes a big difference, right? And again, that is what the devil does. He, he just mixes just a little bit of a lie, in with the truth and tries to get you to believe something that's not true. And that's why it's so important that we study God's word. So I hope this has given you kind of a, uh, a way to think about the idea of truth and, and being able to tell the difference between um, truth and not truth, a lie, uh, a little lie mixed in with truth or something that's completely not true at all. When the federal government uh, trains their uh, analysts to try to figure out what money is not true, they don't study all of the fakes. They study the $100 bill or the $20 bill so that they know beyond a shadow of a doubt what is real money so that they can tell when something else comes up just like the Coke, right? They wanna, someone walks up, hands them a bill, they should be able to look, oh, no, that's not it, right? It doesn't feel right. It doesn't bend right. It's missing this little tick, this little mark, this little watermark, this thing. They know every little, it's, it's thicker. It's like, I can just feel it. It's thicker than it was before, right? They know the right thing so well. So I hope that you will uh, take that as a, uh, a challenge to be a lifelong learner of the truth, to know God's word so well that you can just set it apart and distinguish it from everything else. And you can just notice the smallest little mistake in it, the smallest little change of the truth so that you're like, no, no, that's close, but not quite. So we're going to wrap up. I'm going to pray. Uh, remember, the Zoom call is at 2.30 today. I hope you'll join us. We're going to play more. Um, Kahoot, and we're going to do some more of the uh, is it real or is it fake videos that we had. I got a, a couple more of those to show. And we're going to see um, uh, live on the Zoom call who's can actually uh, pick out the right uh, real 
and fake, and we'll see who can do the best. So I hope you all are joining us at 2.30. Uh, so let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for giving us God's Word. Thank you for giving us the truth, something that we can rely on, something that we can use as the, as the measure for everything else, something that we can study so well that we can understand it, that we can um, compare it to everything else and, and, and recognize when something is uh, got a little bit of a lie in there or it's got a little bit of untruth or maybe it's completely not true at all. I hope and pray that uh, all of these kids and every, anyone listening to this video will do that. They will study your word and they will become lifelong learners of truth. Um, in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thanks for joining us, guys, and we'll see you next week or at 2.30 if you join us on Zoom.